some more in speed records in this day and age. You need coverage. Coverage? Oh, you mean them little root weevils that crawl around popping off cameras in your face? Those root weevils write history. Many of you know that quote by Jack Nicholson and a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Well, you can, and Event Horizons will give you those truths. So when you're mad as hell and not going to take it anymore from that memorable scene in Network, you'll know just what to do. We will draw you in and become your news addiction at Event Horizons. Join us Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Time at freedomslips.com. At Revolution Radio, our world team members are Dennis Fetcho, John Ilias, David Dunger, Hila Cass, MD, Melanie Richton, Jim Mars, Paula Harris, John Trello, Maria Payan, Christopher Husser, D.O.D.D.S., Jonathan Orchard, and me, your anchor, Dr. Robin Falco. Uh, if you decide not to volunteer, it will not be held against you in any way. Sounds dangerous. It is. Very dangerous. Count me in. That's right here. Revolution Radio. Freedomslips.com. Where information never sleeps. Enjoy your extra big ass fries. You didn't give me no fries. I got an empty box. Would you like another extra big ass fries? I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. Oh, I'm sorry you had Come on. I'm sorry you starving. Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we believe in freedom of ideas, freedom of speech, but above all, we believe in freedom of existence through self-reliance. This station is 100% listener-supported, and as a fundraising promotion, I have a kick-ass free gift for a $100 donation. 35,000 seeds. 25 years in the freezer. Long-term storable, 54 different varieties. So if food prices go crazy... The shit hits the fan, or if you just want to save tons of money every year by creating your own food like I do, grab our seed pack special. Just look for the banner on the homepage at freedomslips.com. Don't be a statistic. Don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. We need as humans to start taking care of ourselves and not depending on the mega courts to provide unhealthy, nasty food. Included in this package is also a DVD with 900 survival and off-grid living documents on the offline home canning how to do everything website all on the DVD. So when you're growing all that food, you know how to can it, store it, preserve it, etc. with all these documents. So thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I hope that you will pick up this package and start learning to be free. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps and freedom is one seed that needs to be planted. What we do in life, it goes in eternity. Good evening, good evening, good day to everyone. This is Joe Kiernan. Welcome to Researchers on a Mission Radio, here at freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. Tonight, uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce, as always, my main man, best co-host in the world, Dave Stinnett. <laughs> hey, good evening, Joe. How are you doing tonight? Good as always, my man. Good as always. How are you handling the snow and weather up there? Yeah, I think we should ask, be asking you guys that question. I, I don't think the Southerners handle it quite as well as the Northerners do. Uh you're right. Uh, people around down here uh, freak out a little bit when they're watching the snow. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I have not seen snow yet this year. We've had ice, as you know, some ice storms and such. But if the word snow gets mentioned on the news forecast, my kid's school is closed the following day. And uh, it was pretty funny last week with the ice that we had here. We had a pretty good ice storm, and it really messed up quite a bit. But my kids missed four straight days of school, and it, it's hilarious. Because coming from uh, up north in New York, uh, school would have been open all four of those days. Yeah, they know how to handle it up in upstate New York, that's for sure. 
But in, in, in all regards, we don't have plows or salters down here, so uh, it, was, it was pretty fun seeing them all scramble around. They were uh, they were just pumping out seawater on the streets to just add a little bit of salt. You know, it's funny. I've been thinking it this whole week because Jersey's had so much. I mean, last week we had about a foot and a half, and it's just we've been getting hammered. And, they, and a lot of these little towns are running out of salt, and I'm just like, well, just go down to the ocean and suck up some salt water. It's the same thing you're spraying on the roads. That's all we did. That's yeah. it. Uh, and uh, it helps a little bit, but it, mostly because the temperature really doesn't get below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It, it usually hangs right around 30, 31, 32, and uh, that, that's when it gets bad. But it, it really doesn't get bad. But they do act like it's an all-out blizzard. They will, people will <laughs> out the grocery stores top to bottom, even though they know the, the ice will melt the next day. <laughs> but uh, Dave, Dave, we got a good show tonight. We got a good show. Uh, yeah, man. There's been a lot of hot topics. Uh, these aren't new topics. These these are old topics, and uh, actually, these are ancient topics. Uh, with that said, uh, we're going to be touching on a, a few things tonight. Uh, geographically, there's going to going to be some discussions regarding the ley lines. There's going to be uh, discussions about the Georgia Guidestones. Uh, the the uh, possible astronomical line tower in Rhode Island, um, and a few other key points here in the United States. Uh, there's a few other points in the world that will be discussed. Uh, these, these are uh, global and uh, globally geographic key locations for mankind and have been for thousands of years, uh, quite possibly pre-flood, as uh, many people do see. And people have spoken and commented on, uh, Dave, you and I touched on one time before, uh, about the amount of uh, lines that appear to go from one destination to another on the seafloor that we see on Google Earth. And it appears that a lot of these lines do go to certain locations. And these locations have had uh, civilizations flourishing uh, for as long as we can tell. Um, we have a problem dating these things because a lot of these ancient areas, uh, the only thing left there are stones, and uh, rightfully so, uh, post-flood. Uh, everything else would have been wiped away. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons to that, and it's not going to be specifically all about uh, pre- and post-flood. Uh, but with, with that said, there has been a theory that was put forth. Uh, regarding the ley lines about a, a group of lines that connect many different points uh, globally and uh, that there could possibly be some sort of a spiritual connection or uh, some sort of connection uh, that um, it, it seems very specific and they're, they're a lot more than just uh, roadways per se. Uh, there seems to be something very key about this. And um, and even more so, there's a lot of ancient and new monuments placed along these lines. More importantly, at intersecting points of these lines. Whether we go, you know, Dave, do you want to uh, can can you can you help me out here? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, it's, and it's not just straight lines too, because as usual with any any you know theory you put forth, you have your you have your pros and cons to it, and some you know some people say it's subjective and. Other people say there's something to it, but uh, I think the, the reality of it is is there's an awful lot of these uh, sacred sites that seem to be on some sort of lineage. Now, now uh, I think most people think that, that you know, in the U.K. you have a lot of stuff strung out on straight ley lines, um, but you get other things that are on uh, circular ley lines, like around the poles if you go uh, – you know, a certain amount of distance from the pole. Say if you, you stuck a compass on a pole and you took one swing with the compass, you'd find that stuff like the pyramids in Giza, uh, Machu Picchu, uh, some of the Nazca lines, uh, all those little areas are all in that circle or on the circular line, which is, again, it's compelling. Uh, it's You can't rule that stuff out by chance. Someone knew what those what those longitudes and latitudes were and where those lines were and for some reason they've decided to you know, put their sacred sites and holy buildings on them yeah i i agree with you 100 percent there uh 
everything that you said is uh, directly correlated to what we're going to get into. Uh, specifically, the, the lines, obviously, uh, but more or less the the importance of the geographical locations. Uh, th these are very ancient locations that were chosen. And you mentioned a, a few uh, key points there and key locations. And uh, a, a few of these things that I'm going to get into in regard to some of the newer monuments of this location it's it's going to be a little difficult to explain um, for, for myself because uh, I'm going to try to do it as partially as I can and try to stay away from the the beliefs on a lot of these uh, monuments and these locations. However, one must acknowledge the fact that at a time before us, intelligent people considered these places points and lines to be very important. These, these keys here, being important, are what I'd like to focus on, uh, not so much the ideals or beliefs in these monuments or locations. Uh, for instance, one of the major keys on a ley line would be the Great Pyramid. And we could, we could go back and forth. We could have a whole show, Dave, as you know. Uh, about the purpose of the pyramids, or who built them, or or what are they for? We we know uh, we we could we could associate the Great Pyramid with many different things uh, enough so to sway a belief, but yet we really just don't know. Uh, that's what it boils down to: is we have no idea who built the pyramids or when. It's high and a lot. And as you say, a lot of it's um, there's there's new research. There's a guy out, and everybody knows I do the the ancient text type stuff, but there's a guy named Rob Skiba, and uh, he's kind of a new guy out on the scene, but uh, he does a, a lecture, and it's called the Mount uh, Mount Harmon uh, Roswell Connection, and it's something I guess that he discovered that's interesting, and that goes right along with this conversation, which is in the, in the old text, in, in the old biblical text, uh, they say that the fallen ones landed on Mount Harmon. And that's where they kind of started the, the mess that we find ourselves in today, supposedly. What's, what he found is that 180 degrees on, this, on the same latitudinal line uh, is Roswell, New Mexico, which started off the whole, you know, the whole 20th century and our flying, basically our flying saucers and aliens type stuff. And they start, you know, drawing correlations that, uh, you know, one has something to do with the other. Again, you could say it's conjecture, but it's funny that they would both be 180 degrees from each other, and some would argue it's kind of the same thing. You know, depending on which side of the UFO trip you find yourself on, you either have you know, aliens, inter interdimensional beings, extraterrestrial beings, or you have uh, you know, demons and spirits and stuff to that, that, that effect. Now, with that said there, Dave, one, one of these other points... Uh, when we get into the discussion a little bit about the location of these uh, areas and lines in the Americas, uh, we're going to find uh, some of these lines go through very ancient places, uh, being Phoenix, Arizona, uh, a, a hot spot in that area, and uh, a UFO hot spot. But more or less, we know human activity has been going on in that area for a very long time uh, that, you know, so we, we believe it so much, but we often forget why, why in the middle of the desert. Uh, same thing with Nazca. Um, are, is it possible, Dave, that these are just areas that uh, could have possibly been uh, just not affected since a flood? It's just uh, these are... These are just sandy areas that, uh, without human interaction, really not much has changed. Uh, when, when I'm looking at Nazca with the, the mummies found there and a lot of the things in that area, specifically the lines in Nazca, how they're uninterrupted, uh, we're finding evidence of uh, the climate being the same in Nazca going back 6,000 years now. Um, it, I, I, what I wonder sometimes, Joe, is that how rural – Really, how old are some of these lines? Because say if we go to pre-Diluvian world, 
Uh, this stuff seemed like it was around at that point in time, or some of it was. Uh, maybe it's it's scant, but it seems like we have some monuments that seem to be on these lines that are, uh, you know, pre-Diluvian. But post-Diluvian, you got to figure that things were pretty flooded. What were people using at that time? Um, and if we go by the biblical narrative, there's few people that have to use that. But if we go by the DNA studies, they say the the cradle for human civilization through the, the world DNA study is at the mountain of Ararat, which is basically what the what the biblical narrative says. Mm-hmm. So if, if we go long on that, say we've got a 6,000 year run. So have they been developed prior to this and those, some of those remnants were left over that they could they could follow and things were still on those even though a flood happened? Or was this something that was manufactured in that time period from, say, the Ararat time period to, you know, 1600s or, or or maybe a little bit later is this stuff relatively new that they've been putting on there or is this stuff that's really ancient and it's ancient knowledge that um evidently they it's been handed down because people are aware of these lines because uh, like i was saying in the uk i mean there's a there's a stretch where they have everybody and their brother on like one ley line and it's you know it's <laughs> it's heavy duty stuff it's a it's churches it's uh you know it is. It's it 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 is heavy stuff. Uh, I agree. These uh, these lines and cross sections of the line seem to have been holding civilizations and uh, monuments for a very long time. Uh, some of them were wells too. Like you know, absolutely. If if they needed a way to get water, they if if there was. There was something to where, you know, if people were traveling, these were known spots, evidently some of these lines, where not only could you find housing, but you could find water and, and the necessities for your travel. So, I mean, I, I, I'm right there with you. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really good uh, because if we were to take one spot on a map, uh, Dave, uh, I sent you a few emails uh, today. and. and a lot of pictures that that were put in there. Um, I just want to tell everyone at home tomorrow on our Facebook page. Everyone, we have a Rome Facebook page, R O A M. Uh, if you like the page, you you could even go to the page now, and a lot of the pictures uh, that we're going to be discussing tonight regarding uh, locations and monuments, uh, these these pictures could be found. And these pictures are going to be uh, put in with the, the – we're going to post a video uh, with the audio for this show for people to get a little bit of an understanding. Uh, with, there's a few maps that um, that go back ages. Uh, we, we know we have Ptolemy's maps, which are quite impressive, I should add. Uh, it's right around Jesus' time, per se. Uh, but it, more – in more recent times, in the 1400s, 1500s, uh, we really have some good maps. We have the Piri Reese map, which is quite defined, and it shows the Americas, and it's it's quite it's quite well proportioned. I have a copy of it here. Uh, it's really it's a really good map. It's a really really good map. Uh, however, there, in my opinion, the the best feature you will find on the Piri Reese map are what's known today as cardinal points. You will see several markers uh, with many, many lines coming out of uh, every rose point, which I should add uh, prior to 1500 when the church had a a full gung-ho take charge and control, uh, these were known as rose points. Uh, Starting around 1500 when the church was in full conquest and the conquistadors were uh, doing whatever in God's whatever they were doing in God's name, uh, they became known as cardinal points. So I'm going to stick with rose points myself. Um, the rose points are quite crucial because they are, they are put around the earth on these maps in key locations that have been around for ages. Uh, Dave, one of the maps I'd like to discuss, it's one of the, the maps I included with you, and uh, and it's uh, found on our own page. It's it's the map that Columbus had used. Christopher Columbus used this map, and it was uh, it's it's attributed to either himself being involved in producing it, or more likely his brothers. But uh, just like in the Pee Wee Reese map, 
these maps are much older. They copied these maps. Uh, the, these maps most likely came from uh, the Constantinople area or Istanbul at the uh, same location. Um, th these are ancient knowledge. This, this is very, very crucial for, for human intuition. We've forgotten so much about a lot of things that, you know, there used to be a time, uh, let's just say 500 years ago, there was a famous timepiece known as the, the Nuremberg clock. And it was uh, virtually what we would call a sundial today. But you could pretty much get your location wherever you are. You could get the time on it. Uh, it what's amazing about the clock is even using the planets and the moon alignments is this, this clock you can use 24 hours a day. And it, it wasn't... It, it, it's technology that seems far beyond what we could understand today. However, it was very, very crucial and very important. Tim, are you still there? Well, it was very, very important for these lines to be acknowledged by everybody. Uh, these lines here transcend across the oceans to America. And what we'll find is a lot of key places uh, along these lines that we're going to get into in a minute here. And let's see, I'm having a little problem here, folks. Sorry at home there. We're just having slight technical difficulties. Skype has been acting very crazy today. And unfortunately, uh, Skype ties in with the rest of the program. So, hello, Dave, are you there? Hang on, Joe. It, it, it keeps dropping out on me. Yeah, hey, you're all right. You're okay. So, right. before I get into it all, Dave, uh, with, it, with the Columbus map, folks, if you could uh, get online or get to the Rome Radio Facebook page, the Columbus map, you'll see uh, a lot of uh, really interesting uh, points on the map. You'll see four main rose points known as cardinal points today and these four main points on the map uh well first off i need to say you need to turn the map where the astronomical uh, alignments that look like a record it looks like a vinyl album you need to put that on the top of the page and when you do so you'll have two rose points on the left two rose points on the right uh we have one lower left rose point which would put us down near the southern edges of Africa. Um, proportionately, the map going down into the southern poles and the north poles, um, again, they didn't quite have it figured out how to put a 3D sphere onto at this time, which was vellum. Um, however, they did a really good job. So one of these rose points in Africa uh, would be what's famously known today as Adam's calendar. And, and rightfully so. Uh, this calendar, it seems to have been there for ages. And uh, it more than likely has been there for a very, very long time. And what's so interesting about this calendar is you could, you could use it as a sundial. You could, you could get your astronomical alignments in order to uh, propose yourself a direction. And, um, and, and these are these are not new. Um, so when we have Adam's calendar, uh, let, let's just let's just associate that with being a key point. And then we have another key point in the lower right portion, which would be uh, St. Petersburg, Russia area. Uh, Tim, are you still with me there? I'm with you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I know you wanted to uh, to jump in a few moments ago. Um, let's keep going with the map here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add in after. Okay. I'm having problems, folks. Here, stay with me. And, um, what we have is, Tim, uh, you're familiar with the map, and, uh, likewise myself. We have Adam's calendar. We have St. Petersburg as a major point. Then we have two other points in the North and the South Atlantic. Uh, no key markers for us at this time, folks. However, these could have been at one point. I'm not sure. Um, 
what we can what I can tell you is that when we look at the two rose points of South Africa and St. Petersburg, if we take those points and we connect them, we have one other marker on this map and uh, between the two of them. And what's very interesting about them is uh, this particular point is the, uh, this is the Great Pyramid on the map. And, and it says so on the map, it says Great Pyramid. Uh, the, the purpose of it, uh, we'll get into in a minute. Uh, I, I'm sure the pyramid had multi purposes and I really don't want to put a claim to it. However, uh, when it comes to cartography and map making and ancient sailing, ancient navigating, uh, here's what we would have. When, when using the Columbus map, we need to use all of these points. These points are very, very specific and intentional. Now, we would have a point opposite Egypt, opposite the Great Pyramid of Egypt, which would put us across the Atlantic. And uh, actually, it puts us quite close to uh, Bermuda. Um, this is the point that Christopher Columbus was sailing to. And uh, they, when they were at approximately the location of this point, this would be the point in the journal where Christopher Columbus writes, I still haven't found land here yet. It should be here, and I shouldn't be too far from it. Uh, uh, because proportionately to the map, we should have had a location at that spot. It was known at the time that we were missing half of the map. And it was proposed at the time because of the flood. Uh, when you hold the map upright in this particular angle here, uh, this was the way the maps were read then. And these four rose points, the two on the left and, and the two on the right, would be known as the two columns or the two pillars uh, when it came to cartography and navigation. Now, when we get to the Straits of Gibraltar, this is an interesting point uh, here because this is what's known as uh, when they would say beyond the pillars of Hercules. I want to be very clear. There is a town in Morocco on the opposite side of Spain from Gibraltar that does have a town named Hercules. And I understand that. Now, there's also a small town directly on the coast of Portugal, and it's known as Heracles. Now, historically, we're looking for the pillars of Heracles. My personal opinion, amongst many others, is as far back as you go, historically, we're not looking for pillars of Hercules. We're looking for the pillars of Heracles. Now, there is a book published, the first seafaring book, that was put into print following Gutenberg's printing press in the 1500s. And it gave me an explanation, a very, very uh, excellent explanation into early cartography uh, with direct association with uh, astral alignments. Uh, they were one and the same. We, we understood, we measured spheres, and we also understood that we lived on a sphere. That's what a lot of people don't understand is we knew the earth was round over 2000 years ago. Uh, Ptolemy knew it was round. Plato and Socrates knew it was round. Uh, Pythagoras was the first one to actually document it. We, so say Isaiah knew it was round. <laughs> I, thank you. Thank you. You know, but you know, down to the basic early sciences when they were writing it down, it was quite easy for them to figure it out because we understood the importance of the sun, not just for light, but for everything uh, that that all life uh, was that we're familiar with is uh, basically necessary upon our sun. Uh, but we, we learned to be quite clever a long time ago, uh, more so than today, where we focused our attention on shadows. Uh, we understood the sun gave off more than light and heat. It actually cast shadows, which, which acted much different than the sun itself. And we were able to measure proportions and distances and radiuses and and then corroborating with that we were also able to tell the earth was round because of the shadow cast on the moon causing a crescent moon watching uh, lunar and solar eclipses and uh, this was all information we had quite early on 
Uh, even Plato himself said the world was made up of 64 triangles. Uh, uh, Dave, you, you said something earlier that caught my attention was we, were, we understood the importance of latitude and longitude, but we also really had a hard time with longitude up until you know, fairly recent times. And uh, the, the triangles were an excellent way for cartography and map making because it's easier for us to establish two points of distance and create a third point corresponding a triangle. We, we understand uh, proportionate triangles and early map makers, they put this into play. Now, with the, the maps, if I'm going to speak specifically on the Columbus maps. Uh, Dave, I sent you a map and I hope you had a chance to look at it. And it was one of the early Columbus maps and I had a, uh, like a stop sign put on there with a few other colors and it's intersecting some points. And folks at home, I really wish I could show this to you right now. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at it now, Joe. No, see Dave, what we have, if you could, if you were able to turn it where the, the astronomical side was pointing up or uh, north, if you will, we have the two major rose points on the right and left. And these would be what was known as the pillars, the Heracles. Uh, all landmass and distances and water that we knew of, we were able to measure by this map as an example. Now, on this map, Dave, if we were to take St. Petersburg and we were to go straight to the point heading towards North America, we would cross through a very crucial point uh, just north of the Iberian Peninsula, and this would be in France. And this cross section also goes from the, the north point of the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Pyramid. Now, <laughs> this cross section here, you'll find another very key location, not only along this line from St. Petersburg you will find many ancient cities, but where this cross section is, you will find two major keys. One is you will find a, a modern day construction of a pyramid at the Louvre. So this would be Paris. Uh, another uh, key structure in Paris, uh, which uh, I'm, I still don't agree with today, uh, however, uh, Measuring the distances, it was quite necessary uh, for measuring the world and its area, <laughs> necessary to have two obelisks. And obelisks are basically, uh, when used proportionately, excellent sundials, but more so for measurement. So we, humans, uh, recent day humans, removed one of the obelisks from Karnak, and we will find that today in Paris as well. And it's not the only obelisk removed from Egypt. There's another one removed from Heliopolis, which the two in Heliopolis, uh, those two were used in direct correspondence with the Great Pyramid. Uh, one of those obelisks have been removed, and I know the obelisk well, and I know Tim C. does. Um, it is located uh, in the gardens behind the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And that obelisk is known as Cleopatra's obelisk and it stands inside Central Park, New York. Uh, it's a beautiful structure. Uh, I was privy to see it in New York and it's a blessing uh, being from New York for a lot of these great things. However, I don't agree it should be there. It was originally placed in the lower areas of Manhattan near Battery Park. And I know in just 10 to 15 years time of it being there, it had corroded from the seawater uh, more so than it had done in the last 2,000 years. So I had known that, Joe. I, I, I thought there was one in Rome, as I remember, but yeah. I didn't know we had one in New York. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, right behind. It's, it's really right in the backyard of the Met. It's, in, it's uh, well, because the Met uh, more or less falls within the boundaries of Central Park. Central Park is a, it's a large rectangle. And on the east side of Central Park, you have the Met. And immediately behind the Met in the gardens uh, is where Cleopatra's uh, obelisk is. And uh, that was brought here in the late 1800s um, on my Facebook page. And I will include it in this video also. Uh, I had put together 
a series of uh, about 10 photos or so showing the removal, transportation, and the re-standing of it. Um, it's, it's pretty cool, uh, historically, being able to see it. However, uh, being the, the historian I am with the appreciation of it, uh, I understand it had a purpose on where it was. And, uh, you know, Dave, there are other ones in Rome. Um, we have the one outside the Vatican in St. Peter's Square. Um, which, which is a, uh, an interesting spot because that's actually a cross section of two ley lines. Yeah, I was just going to say for, for, uh, just, just as a segue here real quick, uh, about, you know, them not belonging there. Um, from an archaeological standpoint, which I'm kind of an archaeology, arch, archaeology buff, I think the stuff that comes from those countries should be returned to those countries. I agree with you. Uh, on the other hand, you have like you know before the Muslim Brotherhood got bounced out of Egypt, um, you know we had a lot of reports, and I was talking to Aunt, Aunt Andrew Collins about it because they were talking about dismantling all of the pyramids because they see them as idols that people you know worship type stuff. So you, you, you know, then you have like you know, remember the Buddha that the, oh, yeah. the Al Qaeda blew up. I mean, you get stuff like that where these, you know, the, the zealots on on both sides, but the zealots get a hold of this stuff and they start destroying it. So maybe, to a certain extent, if we keep, you know, it's a, again, it's a double-edged sword. It's I think it belongs in these other countries, but some of these countries that this stuff comes from is are so volatile most of the time that that this may be the only way that this stuff actually is preserved. So I think it's kind of a fine line. I, I agree. I agree with you. Um, everything should be returned. And it's tough being the judge on why it should be returned, or, or more so the conditions of the receivers. Um, you know, we learned a fine example of that with the the, uh, the chaos that went through Egypt not too long ago at all, and uh, the uh, the Cairo Museum was vandalized and looted. There's been a lot of speculation as to who done the looting, but non nonetheless, it. it it, uh, I see your argument on returning things to volatile places because um, are you really doing good at that point? Uh, now, it, it is a tough call, but... Uh, There's a lot of repatriation going on right now. I mean, I think Germany has been given some of their artifacts because, uh, you know, they have, a, they have a staggering amount of, you know, antiquities that they've taken from other countries. They do. Uh, especially Egypt. So I know they're starting to repatriate some of this stuff. Even in the Americas, I mean, some of the American Indian stuff that we've uncovered from burial grounds, they're repatriating those as well. So uh, I think it's a good practice. Uh, on the other hand, I think, um, you know, again, it's, it, it's a double-edged sword. If some of this stuff wasn't, wasn't taken away for, and put in museums and collections, I, I think some of it probably wouldn't have even survived. That's fair enough. Sure. That's fair to say. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that they're preserved. I, I really am. Uh, I'm unhappy to see, you know, in in my time growing up in New York and being around the obelisk, I literally was able to see it decay. Uh, so much so that today you can really, you can really, you're really going to have a hard time making out the hieroglyphs and the inscriptions on it. Wow, it's that bad. It really is that bad. It really is. And uh, but you know, when it came here uh, 30 years ago uh, to New York, it was in great shape. Uh, actually, I have photographs of it. You can make out 90% of the inscriptions. It's uh, it's incredible when you compare it to the uh, the obelisk that still stands in Heliopolis, because <laughs> they're, one looks thousands of years older than the other, and the one that looks ancient was sitting. Right, uh, right outside Battery Park at New York Harbor, you know, just, uh, just getting battered by uh, storms and, and sea air. And uh, but you know, Dave, it's it's very important that I mention the the obelisk in New York because, as it turns out, in the states, big side here, we have quite a few obelisks in this country. Uh, some of them are are more recent. Uh, like the Washington Monument in, in Washington. Now, why would we erect an obelisk in this location? Uh, 
so close to Alexandria, Virginia, which I should mention Alexandria, Virginia was within the original uh, square drawn for the city boundaries of Washington, D.C. However, now, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with this, Joe, but is there a uh, is there a Freemason uh, tie with this? Because you would figure that Masons would have to come up with some sort of base to have this thing played on, and they would probably be the best best people to talk to about erecting something like this. I think it's very fair to assume that, Dave. I think it's very fair. Uh, I think um, it's, a, it's a tough one there. Uh, I, I am not a Freemason, uh, <laughs> so I, I can uh, speak of them. Uh, I know I know them well. However, I am not. Um, yeah, the, I was going to say, the reason I would ask that is because uh, the Masons are, are known for all their Egyptian motifs. They understand the, 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 the geometry and stuff like that. And we know that this stuff is falling, even, you know, even the one on Rome or the one in, in, uh, in New York, uh, most of D.C. I mean, they're all laid out in very specific patterns. So you would figure if this is being put in a specific pattern, there's a group of people who are, who are aware where these patterns are and are placing them there for you know, some purpose. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to use that as a, a segue for a little bit of an explanation without giving myself up too much. Uh, <laughs> I, I do belong to a group, and uh, the group more – I would assume uh, the Freemasons practice a lot of their sacred geometry – um, I'm even not going to use the word sacred with the word geometry. Uh, it causes a lot of confusion, uh, the word sacred. Uh, uh, I get Actually, it's, it's funny you should say that, Joe, because I wanted to throw that in tonight. I get a lot of people saying, you know, well, what's so sacred about geometry? It's math. And the rational part of me says, yeah, you're absolutely right. But, I mean, I think as we start, you know, we're looking into cells and stuff like that, and we're starting to see the patterns – we can maybe understand what that, that sacred part of the geometry is. Right? I'll try to touch on it real quick. There's, there's, there is two key mathematical proportions that we can see in everything that's created in, the, in all universes and here on Earth and even within ourselves. Uh, one is commonly known as pi. We all know pi. It's 3.14. It's uh, the area of circumference uh, in regards to triangles. What's more important and I put pi down in a class B, but class A extreme, if I were to speak with the word sacred in geometry, I would be speaking of the mathematical equation known as phi, P-H-I. Uh, phi is crucial uh, with these groups, and Freemasons with one of them. Uh, phi would be the proportion of all of life is created. Everything comes from this designated shape. The shape is known as Viscia Pisces. Now, from this shape, uh, everything grows. Uh, believe it or not, you come from that shape. Your, your head is that mathematical equation. Your hands, your arms, your feet, your legs. Everything where we say it, you have your finger in three sections. You take the furthest step plus the second, you get the third length. And then take those two previous of your hands, and, and, and then every time. And we get this proportion in everything, in flowers and plants, uh, in every animal, in everything that's created. Um, we don't see right angles. Nature does not make right angles. I uh, understand it does happen. It's merely coincidence. Um, Phi is very, very crucial. This equation, you could apply this equation on a microscopic level and on a macroscopic level. Uh, you touched on it. The phi, the, the phi proportions in the farthest distant galaxies, and we're also seeing the phi proportions that make up your DNA and make up the structures within the DNA. Uh, it just continuously goes to show that no matter how tiny you look or how far you look, you're going to get this proportion. It's infinite. It's it's we're finite. Our ideas are finite, but 
we have to understand these proportions. These are the same teachings and proportions that were studied in ancient Greece prior to the fall of Athens and uh, the fall of Rome, uh, leading up to Jesus. Um, these were teachings that were taught in Egypt, um, in Heliopolis, right outside the pyramids, was an ancient teaching center of ancient Egyptian priests and masters that continued up until uh, the third century AD, believe it or not. Uh, these schools were still going on strong almost 300 years after Jesus. Uh, Plato went to these schools, Socrates, Aristotle, Alexander the Great not only spent time at these schools, but Alexander the Great during his major conquest when he arrived in Egypt, he brought his whole entire army there to just pay homage and pay respect, and then they moved on. He, he understood the importance of all of these things. Now, with, with that said, there are groups, and I'm sure one of them is the Freemasons. Uh, I understand the math that they practice. I understand the ideal of uh, the circumference and, uh, you know, w once you have the foundation of the understanding of this math, and once, if someone could take, take you day by day and go around and point out everything you see on a daily basis all day long will fit into this math equation, in time, you begin to trust that equation so much so that you, you see it in symbols yourself. You recognize it without having to be told. And then once, once you get to that point that you're able to recognize it without thought, then you could start building on that and starting to make your circle a little larger uh, of influence on others, uh, not control, influence. Now that first step of the trust would be your foundation. And I understand Freemasons' first step is their foundation point as well. That's where faith comes in and trust. You, you have to trust it because that math will never fail you wrong. You could test it every day of your life in all, in all aspects of life as you go, but you won't find this equation wrong. And the good thing is masters have already accomplished this so long ago that if we were able to be taught it in such a way of understanding, it would have a profound effect on us, and we might even be able to accomplish a whole lot more in life. Now, these are just my opinions, okay? I, I understand everyone has opinions, but we're all looking for what's been lost, and I'm, and I'm going to try to touch on it today without upsetting other people, uh, teachers, uh, that I've had in my life. Um, with, with all of that said, there, this mathematical proportion has been taught by masters for ages. Uh, Plato and Socrates were big on this. They're, they're some of the earliest ones I could use as an example, um, mainly because they were masters. Secondly, that I know them very well and, uh, I like Socrates a lot because uh, he explained <laughs> it's much easier to uh, correspond ideas and principles with gods or major figures than it is to say I or you because our egos get in the way and uh, we, we cloud reason. We cloud it very well. Uh, these are the same principles that brought Socrates to his end. Socrates was told to stop teaching these principles. He was taught to stop teaching what's above and what's below because he was teaching everyone that everything is infinite. You were part of something very, very special and incredible. Something set everything in motion of profound divine proportions. And the math within you is the math within everything. Therefore, we need to live with Earth, not living on earth. Earth is not a gift per se. It, 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 it truly is a gift, but we've misconstrued what gift really means. Uh, 
we want gifts because we take them and they're ours. They're they're mine. They're it's mine. I own it. I do whatever I want with it. But it's really not the case. Um, well, I was gonna say just to cut in on this. I mean, and, and we're right back to the ancient knowledge situation again. Um, someone, a, a young researcher, asked me this week to kind of let them in on on my little world of research, and I'd ask them because those of us who followed the ancient texts and and the white papers written on these things and whatnot, uh, uh, some rabbis, you know, within probably the last ten years, they did uh, a coding on the Old Testament. Well, after six years, they finally got a peer got it through a peer review paper, uh, a statistical paper. And basically, these are all code breaker type guys, guys that, uh, you know, they, they do all the encryption for all of our NSAs and stuff like that. But these guys had come out and put it to the test because even Sir Isaac Newton uh, did Bible codes. And when when those went up for sale, when his science papers and his his Bible prophecy stuff went up for sale, uh, American businessmen bought the scientific stuff and Israel bought the prophetic stuff because it was pretty heavy duty. But I was saying to the kid, are you familiar with Nachmanides? And the kid wasn't familiar with him. I said, Nachmanides was a was a Hebrew sage in the 1300s, but he wrote a white paper. And the white paper was on uh, dimensions. And basically what he gives us is today's present model of ten dimensions. And he says four are knowable and can be seen and tested. Uh, you know, six cannot. And he got that just by reading Genesis. So I think there's there are certain people who are still aware of the old knowledge and how to find it. It's it's encrypted, but evidently it's there because we've spent spent tens of millions of dollars, if not you know billions, on these super colliders around the world to come up with a model that a sage came up with in the 1300s for you know just by reading Genesis. Well, so and, and he wrote a white paper on it, and it's out there, and it's you know you can see, kind of see it for yourself. But I'm, I'm uh, familiar. I'm familiar with it. And, yeah. and so, I'm, so these guys are pulling information in the 1300s that is, you know, 700 years removed from what we're are, we're finding out. So there, there's something, and there's a group of people I think that hold on to this knowledge. I'm not sure how that's done over antiquity because of all the you know. Earth changes and, and uh, catastrophes and whatnot, but evidently it exists because um, we keep stumbling back on it again. You know? it, it it does exist. I can assure you. I really can assure you it does exist. And how it survived so long, it's really beyond me. I I it, it's possible, Dave. It's very possible that a lot of these teachings are what the Knights Templar recovered uh, from going to Solomon's Temple. Now, that's something that I really shouldn't even get into today, but uh, my, my theories on that is really just because uh, it, a lot of it was uh, their return after Solomon's Temple brought them to the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, Spain, Lower France, and uh, a lot of the early mathematician masters, and I say mathematicians, folks, you have to understand, I'm not talking algebra. I'm talking the geometry that's necessary for life and and buildings. And to, to get into that real quick, there's a long list of masters uh, from uh, that I know of. I have the list uh, from the 1200s, 1300s, right into the 1400s, and it's it started working its way over to Italy, and it started making its way into Italy in the 1450s uh, on a major scale, and it, this is where, you know, my daily life comes in on it, Dave, because this is also when these math proportions of phi were introduced and taught by Luca Pacioli. Uh, he started teaching 1460s, ran San Sepulcro, uh, then on to Venice. Uh, but to make it long and short, there were students such as Albrecht Dürer, Jacoby de Barbary, most famous is Leonardo da Vinci, which was... Uh, Master Pastioli's 20-year collaborator. Um, this and what are we finding with those pictures? There's codes and messages within not, those. There are codes in there, but this was the time when these math proportions of phi were introduced into art. The, these people who studied these principles felt expressing it through art was one of the most sacred ways of doing it because 
once you can start recognizing these, again, as I say people at home, you could start seeing in symbols. And that's exactly what they were trying to put in. So folks, stay back for hour two. We, we're really only getting started. Welcome back to Researchers on a Mission, FreedomSlips.com, Revolution Radio. Uh, Dave, Stanette, and I are really getting into some really good stuff, and I assure you we really are just getting warmed up. Before we dive back into it, folks, I would like to remind everyone that this is the world's largest listener-supported radio. You can find us at FreedomSlips.com, and I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, when you do get to freedomslips.com, uh, familiarize yourself with the site. Look around. There's a lot of a lot of different areas you can search through. A lot of interesting things. Uh, plenty plenty of good things. I, I assure you, for many different purposes. Uh, I would also encourage everyone to find your way to the chat room. You'll find uh, many interesting people with highly intellectual conversations. And uh, you could really find out a lot of information, and you could even catch a lot of topics for other shows. There's programming on Studio A and Studio B at all times. You could find scheduling at the site. And uh, another thing I like to point out is, being the world's largest listener-supported radio station, I don't mind uh, doing promos uh, for bringing in revenue for our site. However... What I don't want to do is I don't want to have to uh, do Depends advertising or any other <laughs> silly advertising in regards to deliver uh, hard, cold truth, facts, and up-to-date news from a lot of other programming here uh, to deliver this on this medium that we are able to provide. Uh, donations, you could you find a little donation button. Uh, as I try to encourage everyone, a dollar really goes a long way with a lot of listeners. Just drop a dollar in the hat if you enjoy the programming you're listening to, whether it be Dave and I or uh, many other programs that are going on. Um, it, it really goes a long way. And uh, the station here is uh, we have several FM broadcasting stations across the U.S. Uh, you could find us uh, on, on TuneIn.com now, Live365. Uh, it goes on and on. Um, I actually picked up a couple of the seed packs, Joe. Oh, you did? Yeah. Wow. That's what I, right where I was going with this, folks. Uh, in this day and age, it's um, you can't really be so dependent on your iPhone getting you through uh, the tragedies that I ensure you will occur. Uh, I'm not trying to frighten anyone, but, you know, things happen. Uh, tragedies do occur. Uh, we, we've seen them just in the last few years with earthquakes, major tsunamis, plural. And it goes on and on. But uh, I assure you folks, uh, these tragedies do happen, and they will again. And I do hope they don't happen to anyone who's listening, and I really mean it. However, if, if things occur and you're pretty stranded and you're without your Internet or electricity... I know the world seems to be ending quite rapidly at this point, but uh, the world will still go. And uh, when that is the case, uh, if you purchase the seed pack, you'll get over 20,000 seeds, non-GMO seeds, I might add. Non-GMO non seeds. seeds. And uh, you'll, you'll get everything you need to for irrigation, for cultivation, 
for, for everything for starting new. Uh, it, it, I even point out it even comes with a Boy Scout manual. And you really can get a lot done with Boy Scout manuals. You really can. Uh, God forbid we have to resort back to mo- Morse code, but it's in there. It's in there. Hey, Joe? Yeah. As we're saying, don't forget, I mean, we had the, the Hurricane Sandy here in New Jersey. And I know guys who prep prep a lot and prep a little. And I'm one of the guys who prep, you know, probably in somewhere in between. Uh, an article had come out saying if it wasn't for the preppers, you know, doing what they've done, a lot of these people wouldn't have made, made, been able to get through the through the, the hurricane and all the power lines and everything else because we had no power. I mean, stuff was down. You couldn't get places. And the preppers were the guys who were ready for this type of thing. Yeah, and if we only had more of them. You know, and that's really how I feel about it. It's, it's too bad uh, farmers are, are really disappearing quick. It's, it's too bad. Uh, we, we need to bring it back a little bit more. And we could all do so. I mean... Dave, you mentioned you're doing some of it yourself, and we do a little bit here. Uh, we could always do more. Uh, however, it's a lot more than cutting down on your cost, folks. Uh, you're going to grow yourself good, wholesome food that you knew what was put into it or what was not added to it, and you're going to eat healthy food, and you really are what you eat, folks. And uh, it was just released recently, too, as we all know, uh, the – they released the, uh, the press statement just this week saying that GMO seeds, when ingested, they really do get into your DNA in time. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a duh. You know, that was kind of why everyone was against uh, these GMO seeds all along. It's, there's a big problem with uh, genetic enhancements when it comes to food. And uh, food we need. Right, Joe. A lot of people think that the... Go ahead, Dave. A lot of people think that the, if you notice in your supermarket now that you have these gluten-free aisle, a lot of people are thinking that the reason that is is because the original wheat grain had a certain amount of gluten that the, the human body could tolerate. Well, they've jacked this up so much, it's got like 100 times more gluten than it previously had. Now, all of a sudden, all these people have these gluten allergies. So it's a good idea to get the seed packs and and get the non-GMO food and, and, you know, get your system back the way it should be instead of all this, you know, artificially enhanced food products. Well, I, I agree, and I really hope uh, it catches on a little bit. Unfortunately, for most people, it needs to be a fad before people, you know, uh, really get motivated on things. Yeah. But um, every little bit helps. Uh, every contribution, even if you do to yourself, will uh give a little more food at the grocery store to someone else. You know, I'd like to add something here. Actually, there recently there's been a couple of restaurant chains that has made statements saying that they're going to be using um, or at least trying to use in all of their branches um, non-GMO vegetables. And uh, one of them includes chipotles. I don't know if uh, you have those near you guys, but... Um, it's like a Mexican food. It's like Tex-Mex. Sure. sure. Uh, I don't have one around here, but myself, I do a really good job at staying away from fast food. I do a pretty good job at that. Um, I encourage many other people to do the same. Many, Especially here in the States, folks, for everyone worldwide who's listening. Uh, it's very true. There are long lines of people at the McDonald's drive-thru. I don't know why, but they're... <laughs> I know why. Sorry, sorry, Joe, but the sausage egg and cheese McMuffin is pretty banging. So. <laughs> it's all about the salt. <laughs> People love salt. I guess so. Well, you know, guys, let's get back into it because uh, we got second half of the hour here, and we're going to fly through a lot of it. Uh, where where I left off before, I was uh, touching on the reasoning of mathematical proportions and why something might be sacred with math. Uh, when When we... If we were to take this into account uh, to certain groups of people who keep practicing it, uh, this this information, this knowledge, uh, more or less I like to use this understanding, uh, has been passed on from master to master, or unless there's always been a master teaching it. Uh, Dave, this goes back to what you were talking on earlier. There's a lot of these teachings that I've, been instructed of and and i happen to know other groups as we mentioned freemasons they will do the same 
it's, it's not only the math proportions that they're using. It's, it's a lot more than that, folks. Uh, what, what I want to get into here is when, before Freemasonry even began, when in the, around the 12th century, 13th century, when this knowledge uh, started really coming to be, and it really, I say coming to be because uh, academies were starting to be opened as uh, in the style of Platonic academies. And uh, these academies uh, sprung up all throughout uh, Spain and Portugal. And these ideas were passed on uh, from one understanding individual to another. However, there were masters teaching it. But I should also mention, Dave, that uh, in a lot of these teachings, and still true with Freemasons today, uh, if, if you'll notice they still go with ancient Hebrew as well. Uh, a lot of their codes, their symbols, and uh, I guess the keys that they use, again, I'm not a Freemason, uh, but a, a lot. it's more than the math, it's the language. Uh, the two together, uh, when delivered correctly, uh, you, you, you get a more sense of understanding, and it's old Hebrew that's used. And the purpose behind that is, in Old Hebrew, every letter has a mathematical, uh, a numerical value, where if you take up the letters of mother and the letters for father, and you add them together, you will get the mathematical value that spells out the word child. And this is how it goes, not just in a family sense, but in in everything with Old Hebrew. And uh, the Bible was completely, utterly changed around in the fourth century uh, by the uh, the Roman, the Holy Roman Catholic Church by the hand uh, of St. Jerome and 80 some odd other helpers. And uh, the stories really got changed around a lot. And I'm gonna try to stay away from that a little bit uh, I'm going to try to stick on the teachings that were taught from Plato. And I use Plato just because he's uh, it's something similar for us to understand. Uh, when we take the state side to the states here, I do understand that Freemasons are a large organization and had been uh, from the days when uh, America invoked a revolution and, and took the power back, per se. But now, these teachings that Plato and Socrates were putting forth was an understanding. They, nobody was trying to pressure anyone into control or learning. No one said, you have to follow my gods or else. Uh, that day did come for Socrates. He was, he was given the chance to stop teaching what he was teaching. Uh, and he chose not to, and rightfully so. He said, uh, more or less, I understand how everything works to the best of my ability, and I, I can go through these every day and show you examples all day long, but you cannot make me believe in a figure that you're putting forth when I can show you all day long how this goes. So when this information... Uh, resurfaced in the Iberian Peninsula in the 12th century, these were the same people that these mathematical proportions uh, will take us out of the Dark Ages. With, with these math proportions, you could apply these proportions on any scale. For example, the St. Louis Arch. It's a key. It's a marker. It's beautiful in America. We all think it's really cool. It's a tourist attraction, but it's a symbol. <laughs> it's an arch, and it's a defining arch, and it's an example to show you that on any scale with this math proportion, you can create this arch. And the arch, as we know, is the most secure, strongest, longest lasting structural enhancement we could form. You can still see it with Roman aqueducts still standing today. And this is a direct correlation to why starting in Iberia, in Spain, right through France, and it's scattered on a little bit more, is you can see why at this time, all of a sudden, we stopped living in small little huts, 
and we were able to build giant cathedrals, uh, what we call the Gothic uh, time, the Gothic cathedrals. Giant structures that apparently just, we just all of a sudden started knowing how to build everything. We didn't, we just re reinvented the map. We, we brought it more into light. We were teaching it. More importantly, it was being understood. Now, when this, when these teachings started making its way across Europe, now, this is when you'll find in the 13, 12, 1300s, giant Gothic churches were being built, enormous castles that we look at today and we say, how did they build them? Uh, think of the undertaking it would take today. And I can only imagine how difficult it would be if not using these proportions. And now, when these proportions make its way over towards Italy, and uh, Tim, I, I, I'd like you to chime in on this in a little bit because I know you were uh, recently there. It, let's just use, for example, uh, the, the Duomo in Florence, uh, the, 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 the House of Medici. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, it's, a, it's a debate whether the Medici were good or bad. Regardless, their influence <laughs> is profound. Uh, they, the, their friends uh, were able to produce some of the finest arts, book printing of the time, and a fine understanding that, unfortunately, again, at the time, the Catholic Church really, really didn't like it too much. And uh, they kind of could put a, put a tight lid on it. Uh, but there's still an example of that lives today that's quite profound, and it's the Domo itself. It's the dome uh, in Florence itself. This dome, this uh, church temple was built and had been standing there for a hundred some odd years with no dome. It was an open air temple because they built an incredible structure, but they did not know how to build the dome. And it was embarrassing for them. It was embarrassing until Brunelleschi came along, who was uh, classically trained from these masters and had a profound understanding of mathematics and proportions. And Brunelleschi showed him on a small scale how he can build this dome. And he's using the exact proportions, the same proportions of the arch in St. Louis, the same proportions of an egg. He literally took an egg, a chicken egg, and if you took it on the, the rounder point, not the, not the pointier point, and you cracked it where you could make it stand on a table, that is the shape he was recreating. And he explained through proportions and math that if it works on a tiny little scale, it will work on this enormous scale too. And the idea was there. They understood the idea, but it took faith in the numbers. It took the trust. And sure enough, Chinoleski was able to build this enormous dome without any scaffolding, without any cement. These are all individual bricks that he was able to assemble this dome in place as it went up, which must have been incredibly frightening. Uh, for the workers, never mind, uh, he had everything riding on it, but he had the faith in it. He knew it couldn't be wrong. As long as he followed the map, he could build this dome as large as he wanted to. So these math principles carried right right into Italy. This is what brought on the Renaissance. It's, uh, it's a well-known fact today that these master artists, Dave, you just mentioned, these people were coding them. Uh, Elizabeth Garner and I have been unraveling Albrecht Durer's codes, which is quite profound. The man is a, a true, true genius and turns out quite the historian. Um, now, when we get into this here, we have to remember these teachings were still going strong, even in Italy, although the church didn't like it, because now that we're talking about the Medici in Italy, in the High Renaissance, we must recall who was the teacher of the Medici family. That was Galileo. Galileo was also told to stop teaching these. Galileo, we think today, was arguing because the world is round. We've already established earlier in a program for almost 2,000 years at Galileo's point, we already knew the world was round. We already had a calculation on its mass. We already had an, a very, very fair approximate distance the moon was. We understood everything was a sphere. Galileo also understood the rings on other planets, the moons on other planets. 
We understood how everything worked. What Galileo was teaching that the world was round were these math proportions. And there's no money to be made in teaching correct proportions, divine proportions that work everywhere. Um, there's no control. People are, at this point, free thinkers. Because now you're on your own because at, what these teachings teach you is not facts, but yet they teach you how to think for yourself. And it's a, not a control by force, but more of an influence or a persuasion or a guidance, which we understand could be quite dangerous, too, depending on who's doing the guiding. And I completely understand that. And this would also explain why even today in America, there are smaller groups that still practice these ideas. And at this point, we're still talking math proportions and applying it to your daily life. And these groups are frowned upon because they're not understood. Uh, everyone thinks they're trying to control. They, they might be, uh, when speaking of the Freemasons, they really might be, I don't know. Uh, however, I, I, I do know a, a bit of their understandings and principles. However, how they apply it is beyond me. Uh, I don't interfere myself in that. Well, let me that's, say something, Joe. Yeah. The, the, the fact that these societies are secretive, it's only human <laughs> nature for anyone that thinks of a secret society. They're holding something. They're hiding something. You know, they're going to be frowned on no matter what. Well, a bit, that, that's human nature. Well, it is human nature. It, it really is. But one of the principles of the understandings is you have to remove your ego. You have to think for yourself. Um, you, you have to realize you're already being controlled. You're already being told what to think. Um, someone, someone said it somewhere. It's like mysteries are only truth, truths that haven't been told. And that's pretty much it. I mean, there's there's people who know stuff, and the whole world's wondering what the hell's, you know, what's what could it be possibly be? But there are people who actually know what it is, but the mystery persists because the truth isn't put out there. Well, you know, Dave, thank you for saying that because you know it's um, a lot of the problems I see is how it's told. Because again, these teachings are not to be taught. It's uh, it's to teach you to think for yourself. Um, with these teachings that we're, I'm going to get into a little bit more because it's going to lead to these Georgia Guidestones, is the, the idea is, is, you know, the goal is the eureka moment, Dave. You know, it's, um, you know when you're, you're, you're in thought, you're, you're, you're thinking of a few things, you can't figure it out, and then boom, just like that, it hits you. And you say, eureka. And all of a sudden... 10 or 20 different things all make sense at once. And it's all coming together with you so so fast that you can't even write it all down that quick. You know, it all hits you. It all makes sense. Those are, uh, that is what the idea is. Uh, if I were to try to pass any of this information on, my goal would be to get you for those moments. Uh, the facts I tell you, are irrelevant uh, in theory. It's you need. It needs to make sense to you. So if I were, and I'm using I uh, proverbially, if I were to stand up on a soapbox and say, "This is this. This is that," uh, it's going to be high criticism. It's people are are, are not going to like what they hear. Uh, people don't like being told directly whether something's good, bad, or uh, it's right. Joe, I'm, wrong. Joe, I'm a UFO, I'm a UFO researcher. I mean, I'm, I'm a field <laughs> researcher, but you know, I'm also a biblical researcher. So imagine how much crap I get from the, the you know the general populace at large. Uh, you know, they don't think that one or one or the other belongs with one or the other. But you know, there's the guy, people who put in their time realize that all the associated crazy phenomena all have similar characteristics. Uh, well, and, they uh, must, yeah, we, we just get hammered because people don't really understand. Uh, I was I was going at it today with with on some Facebook pages, but you realize that the the problem with UFO re research really 
is the UFO community because you keep getting all these newbies coming in and, and guys and and they're putting up like old videos that we all know by and large we've seen them a billion times that they're fake and these guys are going off and you got all the CGI stuff and it's there's little keys that the guys who've been in it for a while understand so we can kind of differentiate a little faster than everybody else but you realize there's so much noise to the signal out there that it's hard for anybody to get anything done. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you said that because it, it really is always a fighting battle and you have to choose your battles. But it, with this, with this one, it's just, it's just kind it's just hard. I understand to a degree why uh, they're esoteric teachings in, in the sense that they're done behind closed doors. They're not considered a church. Um, nobody's trying to put anything on anyone. Yeah, I think the thing is that they, that they or whatever it is or whatever, uh, it's gotten to the point that even if you really knew the answers and you could give them out freely, nobody would buy them anyway. You know what I'm saying? That's exactly what it is, Dave. You're it's right, Dave. What it is. It needs to be, at least from what I've learned in these teachings, it it. It needs to be presented in such a way that you make the realization. Not you don't hear it from me. You need to have that moment, uh, regardless of whatever it takes to get to that point. So you know what the biggest problem for me was. No, go, go ahead, Dave. No, no please, sir. Tim. We're, I, well, I was going to say with me when when I first started, you know, looking into alchemy, philosophy, uh, hermetics. I basically read a lot of crap. That's what it was to me, because I, I realized, okay, I, I'm picking up things here and there, but I'm not being able to put it together. And the problem is now is is in the, the, the age of information really is also the, the age of disinformation. And if you Google search any of the words I just said, you're going to get a, a couple hundred thousand different avenues you can go down. And there's so much crap out there. How do people put together what, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's going to lead them to the, to what they're looking for. You just got to read. You just got to do a lot of reading. That's very true. Yeah, and, and people aren't asking the right questions. I, I, I'll often pose this one and I'll say, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what group or whatever has a 1700 year jump on everybody for, uh, you know, for UFO and ghost phenomena or whatever. And people will be like, oh, it's the Go Dogon tribe, it'll, it's this, it's that, it's, you know, it's the other. And then when you say, it's the Catholic Church, and they're like, well, they're corrupt and evil. But I'm just like, yeah, you're not grasping this. It's got nothing to do with their corruption and evil. These people are getting recon from all their pa pa parishioners for, from the, the, the get-go for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And people don't seem to understand that. And when you explain it to them, they're like, I never thought of it like that. And I'm like, no one ever does. Right. You know? Right. If these spaceships are coming from other other galaxies, I mean, they're flying other galaxies to come here, supposedly, or wormholes or whatever. But for some reason, when they come to planet Earth, they can't seem to navigate this this atmosphere and crash. I mean, you got to start asking the right questions. These things uh, what has make, changed? make people sick with radiation poisoning. So you're telling me these really advanced beings are still using nuclear fuels that manage to spill from their vessels and make people sick? <laughs> so I mean, and, and but when you start posing those questions, people kind of lock up, and you're like, they're like, I never thought of it like that. And it's like, you have to, you have to kind of turn it on its head a little bit and ask ask the right questions, or else. And when you're doing investigations, you have to ask the right questions. You got to understand the phenomena. You got to know the psychical side of it. You have to know the human side of it, the the body language to see you know what they're telegraphing to you. But right. there's the right questions to ask. And then there's the right answers given as well. I mean, there's correlations in the answers. But the regular Joe who doesn't do it every day and doesn't really dig into this stuff doesn't know that. So they're, you know, they're, that's where it kind of gets muddy and it drives me a bit crazy. Well, it, I'm, I'm with you right there because it, it really is tough getting it through to, to everyone. Uh, it's, it's even tough for myself to hear a lot of people's uh, principles and ideas, but again, it's, what is it based on? And it's all about better questions. Right? So it's, I'm going to try to propose a few better questions as this show goes on, but Dave, uh, I do want well, that, that, 
but it does segue into our, the Georgia Guidestones because yeah. you had posted this and you had you had put something that I guess it saw it in a positive light and I, I and I think I replied like I always thought they were disturbing well, because you're you're not a and, and that was I thought that was a nice crux for a part of the show because um, they do elicit different feelings in people. They do, and I understand. I really do understand why someone sees the Georgia Guidestones as a threat. Number one, it's secretive. Number two, nobody knows what it means. Uh, but but yet we could read it. You could read every word on it, but you don't know what it means. You're, we're scared because we don't understand. And it, and I un, it, and I'm cool with that. And I'm cool. Um, if it were a device of control or fear. It, it wouldn't have been in a nice monument in a field. I can assure you folks, it would be on your TV. It would be on billboards, the, the daily things that make you who you are. But now, if we take these old teachings, and let's just say there were, there is a group of people who still teach this today. Uh, here in America, there are people, I, I can assure you, that still try to resonate the ancient ideas prior to the, the way things are today. Uh, I, I don't like holding it all against the church, but unfortunately, uh, a lot of the old teachings, if I find old books that I would like to have to try to explain these sorts of things, Every old text that I need takes me back to the Vatican Library. Uh, and until that Vatican Library is you know, more or less open to the public, uh, I'm still going to feel that there is <laughs> control there. So with that said, I'm going to be as open as I can about the stones. Yeah, but see, I don't see the stones as being – this is an ancient stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. coming from my background in, in ufology um, – you get the, you know, pretty much two on down goes pretty much in like the new agey stuff. The, the one that's always bothered me now, I, I would expect this in Europe. I would expect something like this in Europe. Something about the Republic of the United States and the way we are, you know, and we know the Americans are different for some reason. You know, we, we, maybe we've, we've had it too good or, or we, we, you know, the kind of freedom that we have allows us to really, you know, put it out there. But, you get stuff like maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. And that's like a – that is a controlling statement, one, because that's pretty much all the population of the United States and a, a little bit of Canada but, for the entire world, which is seems kind of absurd. People you know, guide reproduction wisely. Now, now, the rest of these, you have basically you know, man and forced type stuff. Uh, you know. Well, there's also another one that bothers me to a level. All right, I'll try. I'll try to go through these real quick. Then, first one, Dave, you mentioned maintain humanity under 500 million people in perpetual balance with nature. This is a mathematical proportion directly with five. This is a calculation on approximately how many humans could exist on Earth at once without ruining it. And it goes, that's an absurd number. Yeah, I understand. That's an absurd number. The right. problem is, it's not even the number. It's what do you do when you get to that that one extra? Who who says okay? You're the you're the one, and you're over the line, and you gotta go. You know, I mean, somebody's gotta enforce that. What it is is like China saying you can have one baby, and you can have one baby, and you can have one baby. It's just, it's the state telling you what you have to do. Now, or are we overthinking this, Joe? Well, we 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 are a little bit because. These are not new laws that's going to be put in place to, to enforce. If, if someone wanted to enforce these, they would, and they wouldn't do it on a monument. And also, I could say the people who put this monument there are not trying to control you. Uh, this is, this, these are old proportions. Uh, they're, here's how it goes. It, it, with, forget about the number itself. The proportion is just like everything else, where... Uh, we take a tree. We take a single tree, uh, an apple tree, and it grows wonderful fruit and from top to bottom, and all life grows around it. 
and you could plant them in rows and still be quite productive. However, if you just have too much of them in one field, you'll only get growth at the top, you'll barely get any fruit, and nothing will grow on the ground below it. It's really a theory of association with proportions to the planet. Uh, if you have over, let's say we're talking 500 million trees. If you're talking over 500 million trees, it starts to change the balance of nature. That's, that's all the math proportion saying. Now, that is an old proportion. That is very, very old. And, and these are old ideas with a new age spin on it. And, and I do agree with that. Uh, the guide reproduction wisely. Well, I mean, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. If, if we're, uh, we understand careless reproduction in any animal leads to defects, uh, different diseases, uh, a, a breakdown of DNA, if you will, uh, the unite humanity with a new living language. Uh, I, listen, myself, I'm speculative on it, okay? But yeah, I mean, who, who's got the right to say that? You know what I'm saying? Well, and then you get to rule, passion, that, faith, well, same all things with tempered reason. I mean, it's like the problem is that they leave out the big part of this equation, and that's humankind and mankind. And pretty much the way I see it, you know, my humble opinion, I mean, everything that we seem to get our hands on, by and large, we 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 have at it. Yeah, we, so, I mean, we're consumed. you can give a, you can put all these rules and all this wishful thinking – but the problem is, once you add the human element to this thing, it breaks down you know, horribly. Well, that's literally step one, is removing the human element. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, that's the truth. 500, 500 million is pretty much doing that. I think what Joe's getting at is that in the event that these guidestones actually need to be referenced, um, most of us are going to be gone anyway. Yeah, you know, you know what I think. I think we there needs to be as many humans as we can reasonably keep on the planet because when the, when a big c catastrophe happens, it's going to be a lot of little small pockets of human repopulation repopulating this earth because the less numbers you have and the more catastrophic the event is, the less humans you're going to have to repopulate the planet. But I'll have a seed pack, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if if um. You know, again, again, we just, we can't look at them as laws, okay? These are suggestions. Suggestions, yes. Just uh, like the Ten Commandments. Guidance. <laughs> as I said earlier, we can't rule by control. We have to be ruled by guidance and persuasion, and thus the, the guidestones, Um now, hey, we'd all love to have some of this stuff right now, and we think we're you know fairly advanced you know bunch of people on this planet. But I mean, avoid petty laws and useless officials. Yeah, hey, I'm all for that. We don't seem that the bureaucracy is growing. It's not you know we're not we're not making it smaller. Well, the one that bothers me is is the number six. The um, let all nations rule internally. Well, here let, let me sum, let, let me sum it up. Let me sum it up real quick. The unite hum humanity with a, with, a, with a new language, okay? There's, there's the idea that it was this way once. There's a lot of people today that want to have a one-world unity. That's fine. That's fine. It's not directly... Yeah, and, what, and what happened to them, Joe? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I know I'm here. They, they built that big tower called Babel. <laughs> but, but I know I see... I've seen at least 500 million people myself that have no idea what in God's name they're doing on this planet, nor do they have any care on treating it in any such way, nor another person. Or Fair enough. Now, we have... Yeah, that's a greater part of the population. <laughs> uh, let's, let's go to six then. All nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. I, I don't get that one myself, all right? I really don't, but... I understand the principle we had, but this, of course, is if everyone's playing on the same page. That's the one that makes me think New World Order. Of course, that's the one up that makes me. Is what that's I called. understand that, and I right. do, and I do. But uh, avoid petty laws and useless officials. Uh, you know, that, that's a cool one too. It makes sense today, but we can't look at it that way. It's um, unfortunately. The three of us here in America, we understand we really are ruled by petty rules and laws, 
each one of us breaks the law every single day. I, I, I didn't stop completely at every stop sign today. You know, but, I never stop. It right. You, you know what I mean? I drive through every you single cannot, uh, You cannot let these petty little things uh, keep you down. But yet there are people willing to bring you down over them. Um, now, but if we seek like number nine, we have to prize truth, beauty, love and seeking harmony with the infinite. Now, it's sunshine, unicorns, rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave. <laughs> oh boy I, I feel like I'm getting on that soapbox now let's just, let's just go to 10 yeah, let's <laughs> be not a cancer on the earth leave room for nature leave room for nature I say it again and again and again the second you realize that you are part of something very special let's just call it earth You'll have a good day. You'll be able to move on. It's more than just telling yourself that, folks. Uh, the truth of the matter is, you don't have to look far to realize that humans truly are the cancer on Earth. We are the virus of the planet. We consume and devour everything to almost extinction. And uh, so much so that we even have so many people on this planet that we don't have enough food to balance with nature that we actually need to genetically enhance seeds for growth as we have already been into. So let's let's just move completely off of the topic of the guide stones and let's just get back to more <laughs> of the direction. Uh, but I can assure you everyone at home, you could think what you will. You could think about who put those stones there and how they're trying to control you. I'm just going to ask everyone at home to imagine that somebody out there actually cares about the world and yourself and they're hoping to catch on a few more people besides that the rest of you can continue to live in fear but i could assure you these guide stones won't change your fear one bit the fear you have is within you and until you remove yourself from your mind you're going to be the same tomorrow as you are today so with that said these lines that we spoke about earlier we have a major cross-section of lines at this point and which would also explain the four points of the guide stones, which would also explain the four older languages placed on these on each stone, pointing in the direction in which you will find these languages. Now, the more interesting part is, Dave, did you see in the email I sent you, uh, one of them um, looked like a large sundial, a very large sundial in the middle of the ocean, one of them looked yeah. like. That is one of the obelisks which would be one of our points in on uh, the the maps of uh, the Piri Reese map and the Columbus map that puts us down uh, near the Bahamas uh, where uh, actually the 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 line on the map Columbus was following and which is where he landed in uh, the Dominican Republic and then Cuba uh, so right there off of those islands we have a little island with an obelisk there which is marking that point. It's an ancient point, and it's, today it's underwater, so they had to build a little island. However, uh, if we take this point, which is a key point on the map, and we were to go straight to the Georgia Guidestones and continue through the Georgia Guidestones, and you will find, Dave, an another picture I sent you is a similar-looking land clock, which you'll find in lower Alberta, Canada, below Calgary. It's a very, very old spot. Uh, they've dated some artifacts uh, in this recent find going back 6,000 plus years. However, if you take this key point on the map in lower Alberta, Canada, and you draw a straight line directly to this obelisk off the Bahamas, you will pass through the Georgia Guidestones and you will also pass through the Kensington Ruin Stone. Uh, the Kensington Ruin Stone is quite crucial too. Uh, now, Another major, major part of this would be uh, Oak Island. Uh, but before I get onto that, a little quick tip for everyone at home. The key, we have two key words to help you on a map in the United States and pretty much uh, all of the Americas, really. But if we just focus in the United States, there's two town names or city names that you want to associate yourself with. First town's name would be Alexandria. 
like Alexandria, Egypt. The second town you'd want to look for is Augusta, or uh, something similar to Augusta, like St. Augustine, uh, August, anything Augusta. So Augusta and Alexandria are going to be all of your key points on the map of the Americas. Where you find Alexandrians, you will also find obelisks. Where you find Augusts, you will find markers or ruin stones. Uh, if you take August, Augusta, Maine, and you take Augusta, Georgia, and you draw a straight line between the two, you will not only go through every single one of the original 13 colonies' capitals, but you will also go through several monuments, including George Washington's monument, the obelisk, in Alex, uh, just outside of Alexandria, Virginia. Now, now if you start in Augusta, Maine, and you go straight towards the Georgia Guidestones, and you go exactly 500 miles, you will be at the Washington Monument. If you continue on that line an additional 500 miles, you will be at the Georgia Guidestones. So let's start back in Augusta, Maine. So we know it's 500 miles to Washington, D.C.'s obelisk. It's 1,000 miles to Georgia Guidestones in Augusta, Georgia. Now, if I were to go on that line, that same continuous line through the Georgia Guidestones would go an additional thousand miles. I would be standing on the main pyramid in Mexico of Tihuacan. So now, if I were to take my second point, Phoenix, Arizona, I have thousand miles to Tihuacan from there. Now, I would also, for the Georgia Guidestones to Phoenix, Arizona, I have a halfway point. And you will find that town in Louisiana is also known as Alexandria. And then, I don't know why this town's not called Alexandria, but there is a major cross section going from the Kensington Rune Stones to the Mexican Pyramids and from the Guide Stones to Phoenix. And this cross section being at exactly 1,000 miles in each direction will bring you to a tiny little town for whatever reason, I don't know why, Roswell, New Mexico. Now, fascinating. You will also find, just outside of San Francisco, the America's land of gold. We surely knew this was a crucial spot on the map, and we set forth an expedition unheard of at the time to go and find this western point. We went there, found it, mined the hell out of it in gold, and built a mint there as soon as possible. Now, just outside of San Francisco, there was a town. It, the town now has a different name, but originally, in the beginning, this town was Alexandria. So if you take this tiny little village of Alexandria just southeast of San Francisco, and you draw a straight line directly to Alexandria, Virginia, uh, for better, better sake, Washington Monument, you will find that there is an Alexandria in West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, and it just goes on and on, and they're all directly in a straight line, directly from Alexandria to Alexandria, and you will find an obelisk in each and every town. Now, they originally thought the, the southernmost point where the, the Georgia Guidestones are, they thought it was a little lower down. Uh, and this was part of the, the map decoded I sent to you, Dave and Tim, regarding Oak Island and the six-shaped figure, the six-sliced pie. Uh, that encompasses these areas marking this point in Florida. Uh, this is where St. Augustine was built, August again. And it was one of the earliest capitals in the New World, and it was uh, an early fort that was built there. So this line also, if we were to continue down from the Georgia Guidestones, there's another key point right at the southern tip of Florida before it goes over towards uh the Dominican Republic. And it turns out that uh, this is a, a key place and there's a few other people that knew it. Uh, a lot of this ancient knowledge comes from Eastern Europe, as we know. And uh, we will find in early uh, 1900s, we had a gentleman from Eastern Europe come over and settled in Southern Florida. And this man claimed to know the secrets of the pyramids and he built the coral castle on that spot. We will also find a couple other key locations. Uh, let's just stick in Georgia. 
In Georgia, we would have a pyramid, uh, excuse me, a triangular effect of three key points, which would be the cities of Augusta, Georgia, being a golf fan, that's where the Masters is held. Uh, we have Cairo, Georgia. And we also have Augusta, Georgia, I'm sorry, um, Alexandria. So we have three points there. Now, if I were to continue on this line, sure enough, I would ultimately go through Augusta, Arkansas, but, but first uh, I would have to cross through Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, these are all very, very, very key locations. These are all points on the map, folks. The Kensington Ruinstone, I would imagine is very, very authentic. And the years from the 1360s makes perfect sense to me being that we had a master from the Iberian Peninsula in the 1360s who uh, was also known as a navigator. And let's just say possibly coincidence, this man returned to Europe and with the backing of the Medici became what is known in history as the pirate pope. What did this pirate have that was so crucial to catapult him to be the pope? Uh, I don't know what it was, but uh, there's a few people from his town uh, that carved something on a stone in Alexandria, Minnesota, where the Kensington Ruinstone sits. That's right, Alexandria, Minnesota. Uh, what's right next door to that? Augusta. Uh, these are key points. Uh, now, to go over to Oak Island, Oak Island... Oak Island has uh, been used, I would imagine, for centuries and centuries and centuries. Anyone working with these old maps prior to Columbus would most certainly have followed the northern route from island to island. For only, you'd only have to be 200 miles at any point from any landmass, but you would ultimately come to Newfoundland. Uh, the choice to choose Oak Island I'm sure was uh, systematic and to a particular group at a particular time. However, the Mahone Bay where Oak Island sits is sits right off of Newfoundland. Uh, this is one of the keys in the North Atlantic on the Columbus map and on the Piri Reese map and uh, on many, many other maps of the time. Uh, now, if we start there at Newfoundland, I should also mention uh, Let's take the Georgia Guidestones, knowing it already continues to tea with Tiwakan in Mexico. If I were to start in Augusta, Georgia at the Guidestones and go right through every single one of the original 13 capitals, this would also explain, Dave, why Trenton, New Jersey is all the way, the capital is all the way over on the side next to uh, Philadelphia, because it's Philadelphia's original capital. It was important for this line to pass. I live right outside it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, now, if I were to continue on that line right past your house, then uh, we would go right through right through New York. Uh, we would catch the capital of Connecticut. We would catch. Uh, yeah, we didn't catch, but you blow right past Boston and it takes you right through Augusta, Maine. And if I were to continue on this line across the North Atlantic, I will go straight through Stonehenge. I will go straight through all of these other uh, locations that are known on the, the, what is known as the ley line of Stonehenge. Uh, this is an old line. These, these lines, uh, back to what we were just speaking of earlier, these were ancient traveled lines, um, possibly before the flood. I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that uh, people in antiquity knew beyond the pillars of Heracles that there was land there, forgotten land. <clears throat> Even uh, Socrates and Plato say uh, beyond the pillars of Heracles is uh, where the, the golden land was. Uh, they've lost access to that land. They say uh, the, the flood wiped it all out and it's become impassable. There's just so much water and soot and so much uh, debris has come down from the mountaintops. They say everything's been washed down from the mountains and has filled our valleys and uh, it, it basically became impassable, but the knowledge was still there. They knew something existed there. And it's quite possible that many people were uh, passing this on, this information, because as we already established, this knowledge possibly could have came back from Solomon's Temple, which we really don't know if Solomon's Temple actually existed. Uh, it could be these ancient principles and teachings. However, uh, when this information 
hit the Iberian Peninsula in the early 11th, 12th centuries, uh, the only thing I could account for in regards to Oak Island is I, I am well aware uh, the Knights Templar had quite a fleet of ships. And, uh, and I know they were sailing pretty far, but we really don't have any definitive proof to say who was there or when, but it's quite obvious Oak Island uh, had a bunch of activity and people were stashing gold there. Uh, it could be that they just followed this, this line, this ancient line, and they were going to Mexico and, and hauling back tons of gold. I'm not sure. What I do know is I could also tell you accounts of Montezuma's gold uh, appearing just after the year 1500 in Europe when today we have no idea what happened to Montezuma's gold, but I can tell you this. Search Florentine gold coins and coins from Hungary in the 1400s that you'll find Montezuma's gold in 1500. <laughs> Radio at freedomswifts.com. We'll be right back after this message. Moscow's freaks, that's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is mere insanity. Now do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener supported radio. Reporting the danger unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution, Revolution. Radio. Enjoy your extra. Give me no fries, I got an empty box. Would you like another? Extra big ass fries. I said I didn't get any. Thank you. Your account has been charged. Your balance is zero. Please what? come back when you can afford oh, to make no, a purchase. No. I'm sorry you have Come on. I'm sorry starving. 